Welcome to chapter six, basic option strategies. We're going to be looking at the payoffs and profits associated with the building blocks of financial engineering. The building blocks are these first four items listed here. It's a long call, short call, long put, and short put. Those are the building blocks. And then we're going to combine some of these, uh, some of these option strategies, these, these option positions with the stock, and then we'll do what's called a covered call and portfolio insurance, or what's often called a protective put. These are by far the most common strategies out there uh, that you can employ. And so uh, you'll find this material a little more concrete than, than um, boundary conditions, uh, but this is really useful material. And you almost have to memorize some, you know, it would be helpful if you memorized some of the material. And I'm not big on memorization, but it'll help you, um, it, it, it will help you um, move through the material uh, in this chapter and later chapters much more quickly. So, okay, so let's, um, let's get some notation out of the way and look at some really basic stock transactions, stock transactions now, and then we'll get into, into these uh, basic option strategies. Okay. We're going to use uh, NC some number uh, NC to represent the number of calls. Okay, um, it's the number of call options in our in our math here that we're going to use to calculate the payoffs and profits. And so it, it denotes the number of calls. Okay, not the number of contracts. So when you have a contract, a contract, an option contract controls a hundred shares. Remember that? It's, it's not controlling 100 shares. We're just using NC um, here as the number of calls. Just like we would say um, the number of shares of stock is um, NS, number of shares of stock. Okay? And that's not, a, that's not a function of 100. It's just how many shares you have. And then we have um, the number of call options, and then we're going to have the number of put options. Okay. Now, these numbers can be positive or negative depending if we're going long or short. If we're going long, in other words, the, if you're buying a, a call or a put, then these guys are going to be positive. If you're buying a call or a put and, and you intend to hold it, those are going to be positive. If you're selling the calls or puts, these items are going to be negative. And obviously, if you don't have a position in anything, the number of calls and the number of puts are zero, equal to zero. So now let's um, let's move um, to the stock side of things. Those were options, some basic notation on options. And so let's look at stocks and stock transactions. So when you go long a stock, um, here's how we're going to look at it mathematically. We're going to look at the profit here, and the profit is defined. We're going to use the symbol pi for profit, and that equals your profit on a long stock transaction is the number of shares that you buy, right? So n will be greater, ns will be greater than zero times st minus s subscript zero, okay, with ns greater than zero. Okay, so when you buy shares, this many shares of stock, here's your capital gain per share over the life. Remember, we always, almost always in this course, start at time zero and end at time t, which is the expiration of the option. And so this is the capital gain that we have, or it could be a capital loss, so this profit could be negative. Okay, so that's straightforward. Now, if you do a short position on a stock, then your profit on the short position is going to be the number of shares times st minus subscript zero. Okay, well, that's the same formula as I just showed you above. It's the capital gain or loss times the number of shares. But here, ns is going to be less than zero. It's going to be negative, in other words. And so when you have, if there's a capital gain on the stock and this is negative, you're going to lose. Remember, that's what happens when you short a stock. You short a stock and, and, and the stock goes up, you're going to lose. Remember, you, your goal of shorting a stock is you want to sell it high and buy it back later 
at a, at a lower price. So you make a profit. So uh, when, when you short a stock, you want this term here to be negative, and then you have a negative for NS, negative times a negative, turns out to be a positive. Okay. So now let's look at the profit of a of stock transactions, okay? Or op, excuse me, option transactions. Let's look. At, so those are stocks. Uh, let's look at option transactions. Now the formula you will recognize it, but it'll be a little little slight extension of what you've seen before. So here's profit, and we're going to look at here now. Um, in this case, let's look at call options now. So the number of calls, right, times the maximum of zero or ST minus X minus C. Wow, that is really tight notation. You can't get it much cleaner than that, and it's so clean that it might be hard to see. Um, but if you were to program a computer, like Excel, an Excel spreadsheet, you could literally almost type this out. You know, you'd have to have a multiplication sign in the middle here, but you, it, this would work. This formula would almost work exactly in, in an Excel spreadsheet. But what it's saying is, look, your profit, the profit here, is a function of the number of calls times the payoff less the cost of the option, okay? So when we go buy, we buy a, an option, okay? That's the call, that's the call, okay? Uh, the premium that we're going to pay. Now this, this um, formula is so flexible that it, this just doesn't apply to buying calls, it also applies to shorting calls. So this is going to be positive if we're long the call, and this number here will be negative if we short the call. Okay, so now this is the number of options. So put that aside. Now what's in this brackets? This is the this is the, the profit here in, in square brackets. That's the profit per option. Okay, and it represents the payoff, which you're used to seeing. You know, if the option's in the money, you're going to get ST minus X. Um, if it's at or out of the money, you're going to get zero, okay, minus the cost of the option, okay. <clears throat> so if this is, is positive, it's straightforward to see, positive, positive payoff, you subtract off the cost of the call option, right. You subtract off the cost of the call option when you buy a call. When you short a call, you're... you're you're actually collecting the premium. So what happens is this negative sign on top of this negative sign here means you're collecting that premium. And then you'll have a negative sign in front of this. If you distribute that negative sign here out, you'll have a negative in front of the payoff, which means that the short loses what the long is gaining. So there's a zero sum game. Let's actually dive into the four basic strategies that I, I had outlined here. Let's get into each one of these now and with an example. So let's do a long call. Okay, so we're buying or holding a call. Okay. Now, suppose a trader holds one Microsoft call with a strike of 55. The option cost is purchased uh, a month ago for $3 a share. So the call was $3. Assume the following scenarios for the stock price at expiration. So the stock price at expiration can equal 44, 58, or 62. Compute the payoffs and profits at expiration per share. Okay, assuming NC equals one. We'll do everything on a per share basis. There's one option here. Let's actually do it now. So, um, let me uh, just get a new piece of paper. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna look at the scenarios of 44, 58, and 62. 
And we're going to um, look at the payoffs and we'll go look at the premium, in this case, the cost that we'll see that we're paying for the call. And then we're going to look at the profit. So in other words, profit equals the payoff minus the premium paid. That's a negative sign here, minus the premium paid off for the call. And so that's exactly what you're seeing here. What we're doing is simplistically setting NC. We're just looking at one call option. So that kind of gets rid of the NC out of there. And all we're left with is the payoff that you're used to seeing from the previous chapter minus the premium. And that's going to be the profit. Okay. So um, the way to look at this, by the way, is... Now let me bring this back a second. The way to look at this is... Uh, I like to, to lay it out a little more clearly. And the way you lay it out a little more clearly is the payoff. That's what this is. This part is the payoff right here. The payoff is ST minus X if ST is greater than X. So the payoff, if the option's in the money, right? Here's the option in the money. The payoff is going to be this difference. Or it's going to be zero if st is less than or equal to x. And so um, this, this kind of gives you a cheat sheet. You figure out, well, where is the stock price relative to the strike? And in the example here, I'm going to show you, is that this is 44, and st is, is um, let's see, oops, sorry, this is 44. And the strike is given as um, 55. You can see that this scenario applies. This option is certainly not in the money, so the payoff is zero. Okay, so that means the payoff for an option that's out of the money, so you can see right away that this option is out of the money, is zero. The premium we paid was three dollars, and so the profit is three dollars. So when you buy an option, for three dollars and it's out of the money at expiration the profits just is a, is a negative three dollars you lost your three dollar investment in the option now let's see what happens when, when the stock price equals 58 okay 58 now you come over come over here and you say okay um this is 50, still 55, and the stock price is 58. Ooh, that's positive. So that has, means that this scenario holds. So the payoff is positive, and that means the payoff is going to be 58 minus 55, and that's 3. Okay, so we get a positive payoff. You would exercise this option at expiration to get that $3, but you paid $3 for the option, and so what happens is you break even at that point. Profit-wise, you break even. Now, the stock price is 62. Come back to this idea. Then we're still above. We're still in, in, the, in the money. And so it's 62 minus 55 is $7 in positive payoff. We paid it $3. We have a $4 positive income on this, trans on, on this particular transaction with this call, this individual call. That's all. Everything's here on a per share basis. And so now is a good time to tell you is that when we do these, do this analysis, you, most of the time the information is given to you on a per share basis. And if it's not, it's probably, it's usually pretty quick and easy for you to determine things on a per share basis, even if it's not given to you. But the point is, if you do all of your analysis on a per share basis, and, and the problem calls, you know, tells you that it's an entire one contract or it's 10 contracts. You multiply it all out at the end. You multiply the profits, the payoffs on a per share basis times the number of options you have. Um, that way you save yourself a whole lot of time. Instead of multiplying everything out by 100 here, 100 here, 100 here, and 100 here, you multiply it out all at the end. It saves you a lot of aggravation and um, will reduce your chances of making an error. Okay, so now, so here we have, a. this is again a long call, 
let's see what these, let, let's graph the, this relationship. And so if we graph this relationship, you're going to draw a sideways T. And by the way, just um, as I tell students in, my, in the classes here on well, these options, um, when we do these option positions, you draw it, you're going to do this blindly, this part without even thinking. You're always going to set things up like this. You're going to have the stock price on this axis. You're going to have your profit or loss on this axis. You know, a profit or loss and your payoffs on this axis. It'll be in dollars. And then you'll have your strike somewhere in the middle. So set it up blindly from there. So that part you get memorized. And now it's a question of how do you graph these payoffs, the premium, and the profit? Well, this is how we're going to do it. Let's, let's start with the payoff first. So you start with the payoff at first. You're saying, look, when the stock is below the strike, this strike, put the number in for the strike, it was 55. Okay? Now, when the stock was below the strike, the payoff is zero. Right here, it's on this line. The option was out of the money. If it, if it ends up, oops, and I, by the way, this should be a capital T year, little uh, stock price at expiration. The payoff is zero if the option's out of the money. And it, the payoff line looks like this. Uh, remember, it has a slope of one, positive one. So every dollar the stock goes up, the payoff goes up by a dollar. Okay? Now that's just the payoff. It does not reflect the cost of the option. The cost of the option is this minus three. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract a constant minus three all the way along this. So when you subtract the minus three, you get something that looks like this. Okay. Same slopes. This, by the way, has a slope of zero. This has a slope, again, of positive one. It options, uh, and this is another thing you should memorize, when you look at options by themselves, each individual position, and I say each individual position, I'm talking, you know, these long call, short call, long put, short put, they always kink at X. There's always going to be a kink at the strike, because that's when things change, at the strike. So we have our kink, and this is, by the way, what I referred to as a hockey stick um, in, in a previous video. You know, you can draw this further up. So if the stock goes up, oh, you're happy if you hold this call because, look, your payoff just, your profit just keeps going up. So here is the payoff line with the squiggly, and here is the profit line, which has a constant difference. Ooh, this is a minus three, by the way. This difference here is $3, $3 all along the way. And so there we have a graphical representation of the payoffs and profits to a long call. And so you can see you're bullish when you buy a call or you want to, or you hold, you're holding a call. So you bought it already. That means you're holding it. Um, and you really want the stock to go up because you're going to make a ton of money. Uh, or you're contemplating buying the call, then this is what potentially could happen to you at expiration. Okay. Now, um, sometimes we ask, you know, what is the break-even point of this? And notice the break-even point is going, and by the way, you, you do have, one of the things you, you need to keep in mind on these graphs, that this is a break-even point. It's the point where you have a zero profit. So when you have these hockey sticks, you're going to have to have a line that crosses the zero position here. In the, this is the Y zero position here. You have to cross this line somehow. If you have a, if you have an, uh, a, a profit line that looks like this, something is drastically long. It means you cannot lose. Uh, there's no break even. You're just going to make money no matter what happens. That doesn't make sense uh, because when you buy an option, you're going to have. Um, you, you, some cases you're going to win, in some cases you're going to lose. You can't win in every situation. So um, this can't happen. So keep that in mind. Uh, this can't happen. Uh, or somehow you go this way. Um, you know, that can happen, but eventually you got to have this cross. Um, so this would be a deep loss. 
and this would be a break-even point. So this would be a place, a situation where the, the option had a high premium to pay the cost for it up front. Okay. So now the break-even point is when the, the break-even point occurs when you're in the money. Okay, you can't really break even when you're out of the money. You see this? You can't break even. You're breaking even when you're in the money. Okay, so when you're in the money, that means you're, you, we need to figure out the, the break even in the money. So BE is the break even. And what we're trying to de determine is this, the break even stock price. What is this stock price right here that we break even? And the way we figure that out is we take ST at expiration. Oops, there should be a little T here, capital T. The stock price at expiration minus, so this is the, the stock that price, this is the stock that we would get. You know, when you exercise the call, you get the stock price here. And this is the break-even one with the little asterisk here. Minus the exercise price that you're going to pay. Minus the premium you pay for the call. That has to equal zero. So you're solving for ST star, drop the numbers in, and it turns out that ST star equals 58. At 58, that's where you break even. Well, we knew that already because we broke even under this scenario at zero here for the $58 scenario. There it is graphically. Uh, $58. So what I like about the analysis is, look, we put it together mathematically, intuitively, and graphically so that the, the results um, mesh up nicely and uh, a nice way to understand the material. So you should have this in your mind that, you know, you can determine the payoffs and profits of various scenarios. You can graph them. And before you do anything, when you, as soon as you hear a long call, this is what you should be thinking. When you hear a long call, get a nice get a clean piece of paper here. When you hear of a long call, before you do any analysis, this is what you should be thinking in terms of the profit. This type, the shape of this hockey stick in this form. And you know that this, the kink has to be at X. This is zero and this is a dollar sign. So before you do any analysis, this is where you know you're heading. And if you and if your end result doesn't look like this, you did something wrong. Something how something went wrong somewhere in the calculations. So um, remember that this one hockey stick for a long call. Now let's do a short call. Short call. So, remember the formula is the number of calls times the maximum of zero or ST minus X minus C. And remember, this, this formula is so flexible that it works even for a short call. And the reason for that is this is going to be a negative sign. The number of calls that we're shorting are going to be negative. Um, and so when you distribute this negative sign, what you have is you have minus the max plus the call. That is your, this is your profit. That's your profit times the number of calls. Um, if you think of this, leave, make this positive and just distribute the negative sign. What this means is this, without the negative sign right here, this is the payoff to somebody who holds a call we just covered but the holder if the holder wins the short loses so there's a negative sign so whatever the holder wins or loses the short gets the, the other side of the position so um, if this is positive for the holder it's going to be negative for the short and then what we have to realize is when you short a call you're selling or writing the call you're collecting the premium, and that's what that says. You're collecting the premium. It adds to your profit. So let's do an example. Okay. The example is C 
suppose we have one short call of Microsoft. Okay, what a strike. Again, a strike of 55. And we're going to look at the same, oh, same scenarios as we saw before. And we're going to look at the payoff. Payoff. Premium. Profit. And then we're going to graph the relationship. Okay. But now what you want to keep in mind is um, if you want to conceptually lay this out, your payoff, your payoff now, which is this component, your payoff is st minus x, okay, if st is greater than x. If the options in the money, this is the payoff to the holder, okay? But since you're short, you throw a negative sign, see? You throw a negative sign in front of the payoff if it's in the money. If it's out of the money, st is less than or equal to x, the payoff is zero. So again, what you want to do is you want to look at these scenarios and ask, uh, where is the stock price relative to the strike? And the strike is 55. x will always be 55 in this example. What changes is the stock price. So we have a 44 and then we'll, pull, we'll plug in a 58, and we'll plug in a 62 in here. Okay, so now, um, when the stock price is 44, you think, if you're, you think of this as, let me say, okay, the payoff at, at 44, the stock price is less than the strike, so the holder will never exercise this option in this case. Because what we have is, why would you exercise the option, if you're the holder now, to, ex to exercise the option and buy the stock for 55 when you can go into the open market and buy it for 44? That doesn't make sense. The holder is not going to exercise it, so the payoff is zero. Okay. Now the premium for the short is going to be collect $3. The option is a $3 option. It's the same option as we looked at in the previous example. So the premium, or the, the profit overall is $3 per share. Okay. Now, let's look at what happens when we're at 58. When we're at 58, the payoff is going to be, $58 minus 55, $3. That's what the holder, the owner, the long call is going to get $3, but since we're short, it's negative 3. So we lose $3. Okay, and so uh, that should make sense. You pay the pre you collect the premium of $3, you break even at 58. Short call. Now at 62, we're going to lose uh, 62 minus 55 with a negative sign. We're going to lose $7. We have this $3 premium, so no matter what happens, we collect the $3. We lose $4. Okay. Now, let's graph the relationships here. Again, memorize. Just simply put this together, your sideways T. X and the stock price at expiration. This is going to be 55. Okay, now look what happens. The profit, the profit on this option, um, whenever you do numbers below 55, and 55 is right here for the strike, below 55, you make $3 a share. In other words, the option expires worthless. So in translating this, if you sell an option, sell an option, sell it for $3, and the option expires worthless, you are quite happy that you sold this option to somebody and the option turned out to be worthless. Okay, because you collect the premium and don't have to do anything after that. Now, what happens is you break even at a certain point, okay? And then you have the possibility of losing money and every dollar the stock goes up, you lose money. So that's the, the problem of being short a call. This is sometimes called a, a naked call option. It's not covered um, in the sense that I'll show you what a covered call is in a few minutes uh, towards the end of the chapter. But a naked call is when you own a call option or you write a call option. You write a call option all by itself. 
Okay, you write a call option all by itself, you're subject to an infinite amount of risk in theory because there's no limit on how high the stock price can go. And if there's no limit on how high the stock price can go, there's no limit on the loss on the downside. So um, you got to be really comfortable taking such a position because the stock could shoot up dramatically and you'd have a really big loss because what you're forced to do is you'd be forced to buy it in the open market at $1,000, for example, right? If the stock shoots up, you're going to be forced to buy the stock in the open market for 1000 and turn around and sell it for $55. Well, if you do that, you know you're going to have a huge loss down here. You know you're going to have a huge loss. Um, so that's the point. When you have an uncovered call, a call option, that's all you own. You don't own the shares of stock uh, of Microsoft. You just have a call. A sh you've written a short call on it. If the stock goes up to $1,000 a share over the expiration period, uh, or before expiration, you're going to have to go in the open market, buy it for 1000 to turn around and sell it because you can be darn sure that the person on the other side who holds the call is going to exercise it. Okay. So um, this is another hockey stick. So here's the hockey stick. All right, going down here. Okay. Um, and so here you see you make money when the stock drops and you lose money when the stock goes up. You should know that before you even think about a written call, before you even get into it, you should be thinking this graph, that you make your money on the down, when the stock's on the downside and you lose money when the stock is on the upside. The opposite of what you get here with the long call. So um, basically what you have is the, the long call and the short call have a zero sum payoff. So if you were to take the long call Remember from the previous example, you can see the zero-sum game because what happens is, ooh, this is the, the loss for the call. If, if the stock is low, kinks at X, comes up, and it moves like this for the long call. This was the long call. This is the short call. If you were to add these two lines up, a slope is zero plus a slope is zero, 3 minus 3 nets to 0. You're on this line. And what would happen is when this is exactly positive, you have the mirror image of this being negative, everything offsets to 0. So that's what we mean by a zero-sum game graphically. So if you make a ton of money up here, you gotta, you have the short is going to lose that same amount. So the net effect of a long and a call is 0. You're on the 0 line. Now the break even for um, this short call. So this guy, we're back. Let's think about this guy right here, this line. The break even point, you know, is 58. I graphed it, but the formula for it would be minus, oops, st minus x. So this is the the payoff to the long minus with a negative sign is the payoff to the short plus the premium. Okay which is the call that we collected the premium on, has to equal zero. So we're asking what stock price is associated with that. Well, if you do the math, you put 55 and 3 here, ST equals 58. And there we have it for the break-even point. So remember, the break-even point has to be above where the strike is in this case. And Moving right along, let's do a put option. Put. We're going to do a long put, meaning we're buying a put. Okay, the formula generically is the profit equals the number of puts times the payoff x minus st, okay, minus the put price that we pay, okay. Now, this is going to be, we're going to, this will be, um, in with a long put, this will be a positive number, and we're just going to assume it's positive 1. So it kind of disappears, and what we're left with is, when you buy a put, you're going to get 0 if it's out of the money, you're going to get this if it's in the money, this is the payoff, 
minus the cost. So this is your profit per share times the number of shares. In this case, it's got to be one. Okay. Now, again, one way to, to think about this payoff is, okay, the payoff is X minus ST if ST, the stock price, is less than the strike and it's zero otherwise. And so that's how you can break that down a bit. Let's do an example. Uh, let's suppose you the trader owns um, one Z Foods put option with a strike of 40. So X is 40. The cost per share was 250. And the scenarios at expiration are going to be 35, 42, 50, and 50 per share. Okay, so that's the scenarios for the stock price. I'm just making those up as I did with the past problems. We're going to have a payoff. We're going to have a premium. And we're going to have a profit, which is the sum of the payoff and the premium. Okay, so let's do the analysis here. Now, at a, strike, at a stock price at expiration of 35, well, 35 is less than this $40 strike here. So the payoff is going to be 40 minus 35. It's going to be $5 positive. You're quite happy. I mean, think about it. You buy a put, you expect the stock to go down. You darn well better make money when the stock goes down. Or you have a contradiction. Somewhere you made a mistake. If you buy a put and you start making money when the stock goes up. Okay, so um, you, should, you should, before you even jump into these problems, realize where your profits are coming from, where your payoffs are coming from. Uh, and it should make sense. Now, we pay a 250 premium for this option. And we have a $2.50 profit. Okay. Now, at 42.50, let's see what the payoffs and profits are. Well, the stock price now at 42.50 is above the 40 strike. It's above. The payoff is zero. This option, um, you know, it has no payoff because it's out of the money as the holder. You would never want to exercise and sell the stock for 40 when you can go and sell it in the open market for 42. Doesn't make sense. So the, you don't exercise it. You lose your, uh, you have no payoff. You do lose, by the way, you do lose your profit per share. You always lose that because you, you um, because you, you pay, you pay the premium with a put, holding the put. Now let's do um, $50 per share, $50 per share. The option is out of the money. You paid $250 and you have a minus $250 per share loss. So right away, what that's telling you, if you notice here, what that's telling you is if as the stock price goes up, you're always going to lose 250. So it's kind of like a, something's got a flat line. It's got a flat line in the neg negative position, but it will flat line. So let's graph this. And again, without thinking, we're doing this. And you know you're going to make, when you hold a put, you know you're going to make money on the downside. So you better have something that's going to start, that's going to make money when the stock is below the strikes. When you're in this area, you know you're going to be making money. You know you're going to break even. It's got to cross the zero line somewhere. And it's going to flatten out. Okay. What I just did here was I just graphed this line, this row. This row in this table, I just graphed it. Okay. Strike here at at um, 40 and that's where things kink now the payoff is by the way the payoff payoff is right here is this row this is the payoff and the payoff looks like this it's zero when you're above zero when you're above the strike of 40 so the 40 is right here strike zero and then it starts to move up like this so for every dollar you go down you go up so that's why this is a slope of negative one. This is a slope of negative one. Flat lines, slopes of zero, slopes of zero. No change. Okay. Um, 
So there you have it. You lose money. You lose money on the upside. You make money when the stock drops. That's exactly what a put should be doing. Now, the break-even point is going to be this. It's going to be the payoff minus the stock at expiration minus the premium paid is going to equal zero. So in other words, when this is in the money, and you're in the money only in this area with a put, okay, you're going to get this payoff minus the premium you paid. That has to equal zero for a break-even. That translates into ST star, break-even stock price, is 37 50. So right here is 37.50 break-even point. Okay. Okay, let's do a short put. Okay. Now a short put, the profit compactly looks like this. It's going to be the number of puts times the payoff minus the premium paid. Now, for that, that's generically for a put option. Now, in this case, um, we're shorting, so this is going to be a negative sign. And we'll just assume that we're going to short one share so we don't have to keep dealing with this NP. This is just going to be negative. Um, and so it's negative the maximum plus, distribute that negative sign, plus the premium collected. So right here, the maximum in that payoff is from the holder's perspective. Now the, what the holder gains, the short loses. Um, and what the holder lo lo pays the short gains in, in premiums. The premium goes from the holder to the to the uh, writer. Okay, so that's the the, the profit. Now um, remember a little cheat sheet here to, to write it is it's going to be if it's in the money to the holder now. If it's in the money, the payoff is going to be this. If st is less than x, and it's going to be zero otherwise. <clears throat> and with the zero being right there. And then the profit is going to be the payoff plus the premium collected. So let's look at an example, Z Foods, the same example that we're looking at earlier, uh, a second ago, is we're looking at, we're shorting one Z Foods put option with a strike of 40. And we have the following scenarios, 35, 42, 50, and 50 is the scenario, and we're going to have payoffs, premium, and profit. And uh, let's let's take a look at it. Remember, the premium was was two dollars and fifty cents, and so it's positive two fifty. We can get rid of that situation immediately. Okay, and now we're left with let's do the payoff here. Okay. So the payoff here, now, when you short, when, uh, wait a second, when you own or hold a put, you want you make money when the stock drops and you go this way to the left. But that's going to be a loss to the short person. So in this case, when the scenario 35, we're going to have a negative sign. We're going to have the strike of 40 minus the 35 price, and that means the payoff is minus five here. Okay. Now here the option is out of the money to the holder. The holder will never exercise the option when this price is above the X because why would the holder want to sell the sell? The holder now sells at 40, right? X equals 40. Why would they sell at 40 when they can sell it in the open market at 42.50? So the payoff is zero. And the same logic applies to stock price at expiration 50. That has a zero payoff. So therefore, our profits, oops, I'm down here. This is premium payoff. Our profits are going to be minus 250, um, 250 on the upside here, and plus 250 on the upside. And if stock price keeps going up, 
you're going to stay 250. It's got a flat line and a positive 250. <clears throat> so graphically, start off the basic graph. We know there's going to be a kink. We know, now in terms of let's do the payoff first here. We know the payoff is going to be zero when the stock is above the strike. The payoff is zero right here. And now look what happens. It goes negative. So when the stock starts to drop and goes to the left, down, downward, the option is going to pay off a negative amount. So every dollar the stock drops, the option pays off less one less dollar, negative. This will have a slope of positive one. As you go down, you go down. So negative and negative turns into a positive, positive slope. But it's below zero, okay, which means you're losing money here. Okay, but you but as the stock starts to go up, if you start from way down here and start stock starts to go up, you start making smaller losses. Now the um, two dollar fifty cent profit means you collect two fifty, and that's a constant difference between these two lines. And so now, basically, by adding two fifty all along, I've basically just graphed the profit line. So the profit line is 250, 250 all the way. It would go on forever in this direction, 250. And um, what we're gonna have is we're gonna start to lose money. And so at $35 a share, we're gonna lose money. <clears throat> so you can actually put the numbers in if you want. At $35 a share, we're gonna move, we're gonna lose $5 here, right? And Oh, the payoff, sorry, that's profit. We're gonna lose $5 at 35, right? But we add 250 premium collected. That means we only lose 250. And here we are at, again at 35. So at 35, the payoff is minus five, the profit is minus 250. The difference is that positive 250 we collected in terms of a premium, okay? Now, um, you can find a break-even point. Again, you're gonna have a break-even point, in this case, right here. It's gotta be below the strike is the break-even point. And the formula will be minus X minus ST star for break-even plus the premium equals zero. And if we plug the numbers in, I challenge you to plug the numbers in, you'll come up with um, 3750 is the break-even point, okay? And so uh, what you see compared to now the short put versus the long put, the two, compare the two, you have a situation that looks like this. <clears throat> we had, let's just look at profits now. The long put had a hockey stick that looked like this. The short put we just covered had a hockey stick that looked like this. If you add the two together, here you have a slope of zero, a slope of zero. We're on this line right here. This, it's not quite drawn to scale. I should have drew this a little bit down further like this. Get rid of that. So that um, when you add this positive 250 with this negative 250, you know, end up right here on the zero line. And um, if you go all the way down here, obviously you're breaking even right here. And for whatever you gain here, you lose over here. And so this is a slope of uh, oops, negative one. And this is a slope of positive one. The slopes add up, flat line again, so you're right here. That's the zero sum game graphically. What the holder, what the holder of the put, the long put gains, the short, or whatever loses, the short gains and vice versa. Now what we want to do is we want to combine what we've just covered. What we just covered was the basics of options. And what we covered was no matter what the strategy, um, and no matter what you thought the market was going to do, the market's going to go up, the market's going to go down, you can make money either way. And so we had a long call. We had a short call. Oops, that should be right um, on the line here. Then we had a change of colors. We had a long put and we had a short put.
put. And so no matter what happens, we can make money on the upside or if the market drops, we can make money also on the downside for the market. Okay, so now what we wanna do is, what we've done here, and this is sometimes hard for people to get a handle on, is we've looked at options all by themselves. I know it seems kind of strange to say options all by themselves because we keep looking at the stock price. <clears throat> but you can go to the Chicago Board of Options Exchange and just buy a call option. You don't have to own the underlying stock. You can buy or short a put. You don't have to own the underlying or have a short position in the underlying stock. You just go and you buy the option. So sometimes that's hard for people to wrap their heads around, but you gotta get very used to that because that's all we've done in this. All we did was look, we looked at a derivative. An option is a derivative, derives its value from, from the stock. But we don't own the stock in these examples, these four situations. Now what we wanna do is we wanna combine an option and the stock. And we're gonna combine them in such a way that we have, um, you know, that it's a benefit and it's a strategy now for the investor. So we can rearrange to whatever the position of the market gives us, whatever the risk and return profile of the market, we can rearrange it to our benefit. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to look at a covered call in a minute. We're gonna look at it generically. And what you do with a covered call is you short the call and you own the underlying stock. And we'll look at the combined position of those two and evaluate, you know, why would we ever do this and what is, what's the outcomes? Um, but this is the building blocks to it, this, this type of modeling here. And then we're gonna look at um, generically a put, a protective put, which is sometimes called portfolio insurance. And we're gonna look to see what is the profit and payoffs with portfolio insurance and how does that rearrange what the market has to offer us? And then what we'll do is we'll actually apply it to two examples. We'll do a covered call example and we'll do a protective put example. Covered call. Okay, the covered call. So you can call, think of this as a, as a strategy. And a covered call involves owning a share of stock. So you're long a stock and you're writing a call option against it. And your motive here, and it's typically the motive of when you write options, your, your motive is to write an option. So, so, so you're basically selling it to somebody else and you're hoping and praying that an option becomes worthless. Now you don't know that until, you know, expiration, but we're, that's what you're hoping. You're hoping the option becomes worthless. And, but the holder on the other side is, is hoping when they buy it, they hope, they're hoping that it's in the money when they buy it. But remember, the opposite side has to be uh, take an opposite position. From the holder, holder expects it to go up, then uh, the stock to go up. The writer expects it to go down. Um, and with a written call, you, you hope to keep writing options and hoping the option expires worthless, and then you write another one all over again, okay? But in this case, you're covered in the sense that it's not a naked call option by itself. It's covered in that you have the underlying shares of stock in case the option gets exercised and they call away your shares. Now, let me break that, you know, I'll make it clear with, as we go through how that works. Uh, but let's first, before we go further, look at the profit to it. And the profit is nothing but the sum of what the stock is doing plus what a written call is doing. It's the sum of those. So um, profit-wise for the covered call is equal to, it's the number of shares of stock that we own. So very generically here. That's our profit per share right there. And a profit per share times the number of shares, that's a profit or, a profit or loss for a position in stock. Now we're gonna have a call position, right? And so we're gonna add the call position for the moment and we're gonna have a number of call options and C and we're gonna have the payoff and the premium associated with it. So we're gonna have maximum
of this. So this is the payoff and the premium like we saw earlier. And so this is the profit or loss for the entire stock position. This is the profit or loss for the entire call position. Now, we're going to be long stock, short the call. So what that means is, and we're going to look at one share each, one option each. So this will be positive one. And when you have positive one, you don't have to write anything. It kind of just disappears because you multiply positive one by anything. It doesn't do anything. So this is a profit per share. And then we're going to write the call. And we're going to just write ones. This will be a negative one. So um, when you write the negative one, overall what you'll get is ST minus S. That's the profit on the stock because remember, you're long the stock. And so you're going to make this gain or loss. You short the call. So distribute the minus sign, minus max. And the minus sign goes in front of the C also. It's because we, when we short a call, we end up collecting the premium. And so here it is, positive sign. So cover call strategy is, is a strategy that reduces, it's a risk reducer. Okay, it reduces the risk to the investor who owns the underlying shares. So you own the underlying shares, you'll reduce risk by the amount of premium you're going to collect. Um, and I'll show you that in, in an example. Okay, but it's a, it's a less, it's a reduced risk strategy with lots of potential upside. And so that's the point. You got some good potential upside. And so um, the investor is basically trading upside potential I messed that up. So you got the, the the profit here from the stock. You got the payoff, and then you got the premium. And so this is a risk-reducing strategy when you do a covered call. And uh, basically what happens is you're trading away the potential upside to the stock for the for sure cash that you're going to get. So you're trading away the potential upside that you get from the stock by itself. So if you had the stock by itself, this is what would happen per share, right? But what you're doing is you end up trading this potential upside for the positive cash flow now. Potential now cash flow. And so that's the, the, the thing with a, with a covered call. And we'll look about that. So if the option gets exercised now with a covered call, if the option gets exercised, you have and own the call to be able to give and sell to the holder at strike X. Okay, so you're covered in that respect. Now we're going to do a protective put. And the protective put has a profit that looks like this. Remember, it's long the stock, so you own the stock and you're going to buy a put profit number of shares of the stock so here's the gain or loss on the stock the profit or loss depending on how many shares you have at the moment and then we're going to have the profit on the put Now, when we do a protective put, we're long a stock. So this NS is going to be positive. Let's assume we just deal with one share. So this is a positive one. Okay? And when we do a long put, this NP is going to be positive. Let's say one, just one put. So that's positive also. So these kind of guys wash away because multiplying by positive one doesn't do anything. And what we're left with is the profit or loss from the underlying stock plus the payoff minus the premium. And this is the option profit right there. The payoff minus the premium. And so there we just decompose these, these strategies um, by decomposing them and just adding up the profits and payoffs to them to figure out what, 
what happens. Now let's do an example. Let's do an example of a covered call. Assume we have a thousand shares. We purchase, get it more generic, we do a thousand shares of Oracle, okay? We purchase it, we own the stock, it's at $75 a share right now. So S equals 75. And then you sell, we're gonna sell some Oracle calls with a strike of 80. Okay, and the premium for the call is going to be $3, okay? So we've got, got a lot of the information we need. Now the question is, how many contracts, since we don't have just like 100 shares, we're now asking, we're backing up and looking at a slightly more realistic example. Um, instead of doing everything on a, right now, starting off with just one share, let's say you really have a position of 1,000 shares. How many contracts do you need? Now remember, a contract controls 100 shares. So you have 1,000 shares of stock. Each contract controls 100 shares. And so you're going to need 10 contracts. And 10 contracts for this strategy to work as a covered call. That's just um, information you just want to keep in your back pocket for now. And now what we want to do is let's look at everything on a per share basis like we've been doing. And then when you get done, you can always multiply everything by 10 contracts times 100 shares and you can figure out the profit or loss for the entire position. So now, let's look at the payoff strategies here. The payoffs, um, let's, the scenarios I have written are 60, 75, and I'm leaving a little space here. You might wanna leave a little space in your notes. I'm doing that for a reason. 90, and then 100. So let's assume the stock could be 60, 75, 90, or 100 at expiration. And so let's look at the um, stock. payoff and we want to look at the option payoff and we want to look at the premium collected and then we're going to add all that up and we're going to come up with the profit on the CC covered call so now let's evaluate the stock payoff and the payoff to the option and the premium when we have a $60 per share scenario. Now, when the, the stock we were, we were originally at here, 75, when we put on this position was, it was the stock price and the stock price is now 60. See, we lost 15 on the stock price. So we're just looking at the stock all by itself, five, minus 15 loss, okay? Now, what we wanna do is we wanna figure out what, what is the payoff on the option? Well, remember the payoff on the option is minus st minus x if st is greater than x and then zero otherwise so this option here is out of the money we're basically in this scenario the stock price at 60 is below the strike of 80 so the payoff is zero but you collected the three dollar premium by selling the call so we lose twelve dollars on that scenario when the stock drops Okay. Now let's do let's look at what happens when the stock is at 75. Well, when the stock was at 75 and it's now at 75, we break even on the stock zero. The option is still below the stock is still below the strike, so the option is out of the money still. You collect the three dollar premium, and you're at a three dollar profit at 75. Now at 90, the stock is going up. You own the stock. And so you're making a $15 profit, 90 minus the 75. Okay, not too bad. Now the stock price is above the strike. And so it's minus 90 minus 75. And this is going to be, let's see, oh, 80, I'm sorry, 80 is the strike. 80 is the strike. It's minus 10 is the payoff for that call. We collect the $3 premium and everything boils down to $8 positive on, on the upside, okay? Now at $100, the stock was 75, it's 100 now, you made 25 per share on the stock, not too bad. 
Now the um, call payoff, still following this scenario because the stock price at 100 is greater than the 80 strike. It's minus 100 minus 80 is minus 20 plus 3. And what do you get? $8. And so no matter what happens with this stock price as it goes up and up and up, you get a flat line at 8. 888 in terms of profit for the overall position. Okay, so um, what you can do, and I left it blank here, is put in, you know, at what point do you have a zero break even? No, what what point do you have a zero break even? And you know you're going to collect three, and so hey, try to see if you can back into what that stock price ought to be. What what is this? ST star, the break-even stock price, what should that be um, in order for this to be zero? Which means basically the stock payoff and the option payoff must net out to zero, or must net out to minus three in order for it to offset this three to get you down to zero. So that's something to think about. And you'll see, you'll, you'll kind of see it when I graph it, where, where that ought to be. So let's graph it. Now let's see if I can get this right on the screen here. Because this graph will be a little messier, so I'm going to restrict the, I'm going to restrict the graph to just having profits, um, and I'm going to restrict the graph. Well, let me take I take that back. I'm going to show this. I'm going to show more than just the profits here. Um, I'm going to show the profits for the call options, and I'm going to show um, the the payoff also for the stock so bear with me here there's a lot to write down okay so um when we let's let's put these numbers in we got 80 for a strike we got the stock at 75 okay and so here we have the basic setup at this point this was s subscript zero the price we started out with okay now we um let's do the stock first the stock first is not that bad. The stock first looks like this. Okay, this is the payoff for the stock alone. Because if the stock ends up at expiration, you see we're at expiration here, stock ends up at expiration at 75, and the, the stock was 75 when we entered it. So we break even on the stock itself right here. That's what that point shows you. If the stock goes up to 80 and we paid 75 for it, then we make a $5 profit and come up over here. And this is going to be positive $5. Okay? So what this slope is, this is a slope of positive 1. For every dollar the stock goes up, you make a profit, a payoff of a dollar. Every dollar up, you make a dollar and every dollar it goes down you lose a dollar slope of positive one that is the payoff profile on an individual stock okay. now we know so that's just the stock we just graphed we just graphed this right here now let's do the cover let's do the, the call position you know what a call position looks like you know you know that it looks something like this. I told you to just memorize what a short call looks like. And you know that's what the relationship, you have a short call, you better have a graph that looks like that because that's the profit to a short, to a short call. Okay. Now let's see. So we're going to have a short call where we collect $3. And so if the option is out of the money by $3, Right, we're going to have straight line here of zeros, or of a, a straight line, a slope of zero, but it's going to be three dollars, three dollars premium collected. Okay, because the options in the money, the payoff will be zero. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to kink at X and it's going to go down. This is the call by itself. Call alone. That's a naked call all by itself. That's exactly the, the number two scenario we covered at the beginning of this chapter in this video. Okay, so now we have the stock alone, the call alone. Now all we have to do is add them up, so to speak, literally, which is what I did literally here. I added things up. 
which was the stock and the call. And I'm going to graphically add everything up here. So it gets a little, that's why I'm got to be careful how many lines we put here. I try to just put the, um, the minimum amount of lines that I need to, to explain this story because you'll have too many of them otherwise. So what I want to do is I want to combine these two and show what a covered call position looks like, which is a stock alone plus a call alone. Well, what we have here is a covered call is we have the stock and we're going to have a um, note, notice here we have a slope of positive one plus a slope of zero. So when you have a slope of positive one and a slope of zero, that means anything to the left here, anything where my fingers are right here, is going to have a slope of one. It's going to look like this. And it has a slope, slope of positive one. And you know when we get past x, we have a slope of negative one, and we have a slope of positive one for the stock, they're going to net out, and it's going to flatline. And it's going to flatline at $8 a share. Eight. Okay, so here we are, flatlining. So this is a covered call, CC, a covered call position. Okay, notice what happened. We traded the upside potential of the stock. Here was the upside potential. It was all the way up. We traded that away, and now we've capped, we put a ceiling on our profits. But what we've done is we've reduced our risk by $3, so our profits are, are, are better by $3 being on this line. We don't lose as much money, or we make even more by three, a constant $3 all the way. And that's the premium from the option itself. Okay. So now, there you have it. What happens is you, you trade off the upside potential of the stock for, for the cash flow right now and the risk reduction of a bid on the downside. Now, you can plot the numbers here if you want. You know, you can plot the numbers. So when we're at 60 here, it's going to get a little messy, 60. Then we, we lose 15 on the stock, minus 15, right? And then we have $3 on the option. And so what we do is we lose $12 overall on the covered call, minus 12 right here. And you can do that all along the way. So if you're, you're at 100, that at 100, we would have made 25 on the stock by itself. We'd be way up here to 25. But we would have lost 20 on the call, but gained uh, in terms of payoff, but gained three dollars on the premium. We we would end up with a positive eight dollars right here. Okay, so we would have gained 25. We would have lost 20, but gained three. We end up net right here at eight dollars a share. Okay, so you can also see where's the break even. Well, the break even here is below, um, and it's below. In this case, well, it's going to be below X when the option is in the money to the holder and it's out of the money to the writer. The break even point's going to be here. Now, remember, you're always going to have a break even point. It's got to cross the X, the X axis has to. And so it turns out the break even point is. ST, the stock, right? That's the profit on the stock, plus the premium on the covered call equals zero. And so we end up with ST equals 72. Stock price at break even at expiration is $72 per share. Okay, now let's do a protective put. So these are the two most common option strategies. First was the covered call, where you short the call and own the stock. The next is a protective put, where we're going to own the put and we're going to own the stock. And it's going to be a form of portfolio insurance. And so I've got a nice example to help um, give you some better context about how these things work and how the world of finance works. And so that's what we'll do here on the next slide. Okay, let's do a protective put. In other words, 
portfolio insurance and we're going to go right into a, an example and we're going to do an, an, ex, an example that I think is, is very realistic and will help you uh, better understand the mechanics all the way through uh, a, a situation where you want to hedge a portfolio of stocks. So let me go over the example now. You're, suppose you're a portfolio manager with a well-diversified mutual fund. Call it equity value. And uh, the, the manager expects the stock market to drop sometime in the next three months coming up. Within the next three months, uh, expects a, a major drop. Now, the fund's investment policy, which is found in the prospectus, states that the fund must be at least 90% long in stocks. It must be invested 90% long in stocks. So keep in mind when you... When you hand your money over to a professional money manager at a mutual fund, the mutual fund has to, by law, specify what its objectives are and its strategies, and, and, it, and it needs to follow through with them. The Securities, the Securities and Exchange Commission looks at this carefully, and investors, they don't want to part with their money not knowing where it's going to go. They want to know exactly how it's going to be managed. So the fund states that 90% of the fund must be long, Okay, at all times, and is only allowed to employ, in this case, um, derivative contracts such as options to hedge potential risks by, by the portfolio. So there's a little leeway here in that the portfolio manager, while locked into keeping at least 90% long on, in, in the stocks, um, has a little leeway to try to hedge and reduce those risks, especially if they think the market's going to drop in the next three months. Okay. So now, for, let's move further. The uh, portfolio is valued at $10 million and has a beta of 1.0. Okay? Now, you remember what beta is. Beta tells you the volatility of an underlying security relative to an index. Um, and so you can have a beta of a, of a portfolio. And if you have a beta of a portfolio of one, that means your portfolio is moving pretty much in sync with the market on average. So if the market goes up, say, 10%, plus or minus, goes up or down 10%, and this is the market, then your portfolio goes up or down 10%. So when the market goes up 10%, your portfolio is likely to go up 10%. If the market goes down 10%, your portfolio is likely to go down 10%. It's moving in sync with the market when you have a beta of your portfolio equal to 1. Okay? Uh, later, in, when I do an extension of this problem, we're going to look at a beta uh, of the portfolio. We're going to just sort of change the beta and assume that it's twice as volatile. Well, so that's coming up down the line. But let's first get this, this uh, beta 1 portfolio uh, done. And, and so um, continuing with the example, the information for the example, the beta is 1. And um, given the situation, the fund manager buys... S&P 500 puts. So um, this, keep in mind, this, this portfolio manager is man managing $10 million worth of stock that, that moves pretty much in sync with, with the market. And the S&P 500 represents the market. It's what we're going to designate as a, a representative of the market. And so the manager is going to buy, now buy, S&P 500 put options with a strike of 2200 Okay, so X equals 2,200, and um, they mature in three months. The put options have a premium of $45 a share, and the index today is 2,250. Okay, so automatically we can see that these options are slightly out of the money by $50 because you have the right to sell at 22 when the market is actually at $22.50, they're $50 out of the market. Okay, so now the question becomes: Let's you know, let's do the table that we the, uh, the tables that we've been working on. Let's do a table for this scenario, uh, for this situation where the scenarios are seventeen hundred two thousand. 2295 and 2400. Okay, so let's run those scenarios and we'll do everything on a per share basis. And then we'll 
Um, we're going to check our work after we're done, after we do everything on a per share basis, which the per share basis lays a really nice framework and lays down a nice um, foundation to what we need to go to go a little further. But for analytical purposes, it's a nice analysis. So let's let's go right into it. And then what we'll do is we'll, we're going to graph the results. So let's look at the stock index. Okay, we're going to do everything on a per share basis at the moment. Um, we're going to look at the stock index payoff. We're going to look at the payoff to the option, the premium for the option, and then the profit on PP, which stands for protective put. Okay, so now um, keep in mind a little cheat sheet right here. X equals 2200 and the stock price when we started out was 2250. Okay. Now, this first scenario says, look, the stock market drops. So the S&P 500, so this is the S&P 500 scenario. The S&P drops to 1700. It was 2250 when we put this position on. So we just lost $550 from an index perspective. The index fell $550. Okay. Now let's do the payoff to the option. Now you remember the payoff to the op for a put option is we're buying a put option. You so we're long the put. It's the difference between the strike and the stock if if it's in the money, and that happens when the stock price is less than X, and it's going the payoff's going to be zero if the stock price is greater than or equal to X. And in this case, we're following this line, this row right here. And because the stock price is less than the strike of 22, then the payoff is going to be $500. And that's merely um, the 2200 minus 1700 in the scenario. That's so $500 positive. Now, before you go any further in this analysis, you got to ask yourself, does this make sense? Do I have my signs right and the magnitudes properly, you know, approximately correct? And the answer is, yeah, you know, these two numbers are reasonably close and they offset. Well, they, they better offset because think about it. You as the portfolio manager were concerned that the, the market was going to drop and your $10 million portfolio was going to drop significantly. So you bought these put options to hedge that risk. That implies these put options better pay off and, and something positive to offset those or you've done something wrong. Uh, so in this case, notice the stock, the index fell 550. Your payoff is 500. Now, there's a difference of $50, and the reason is these are uh, these options are out of the money by $50, and so you can see this, the market had to drop, the market had to drop $50 before it got at the money, and then it fell even further down to $1,700. So the fact that we have a, the, the stock and the, and the strike are slightly off by 50 bucks accounts for this, this difference in $50, and it looks like we had, we've under-hedged, but... Um, Let's continue with the with the story uh, here. Now, the premium that we pay for this is forty five dollars, as given in the problem, and so um, this nets out to be four fifty five. By the way, um, that's what the the pay the the profit on the option overall is, as an aside. Now, the um, overall profit from this position will be. Um, minus $95. And so we lose $95 on this position. Part of it was because the $50 from the fact that we we bought a, an option that was slightly out of the money by $50. And when you have an option that's slightly out of the money, it means the premium is is it costs less. So a lot of people who put on protective puts, you know, they want to insure but they want to have cheap insurance, they'll buy an option that's slightly out of the money. And that's exactly what happened. So we're going to lose $50 because of that difference in the strike in the stock here. And then we're going to lose, you know, we had to pay an insurance premium of $45. And that accounts for the $95 loss. 
Okay, so you can see where that loss comes about. Now let's do the scenario of 2000. Well, if we started off at 2250, it goes to 2000, we lost 250. Um, now let's do the, um, the payoff to the option. So we are at um, 2000, which is below the strike, which is $200 below the strike. So the strike stays the same. This is 2000 now. And so we gain $200. Again, the difference is that $50 between the strike and the, and the stock or the index price uh, when we put this position on. We paid $45 for the option. And so we overall, we lose $95, which kind of tells you right off the bat, we flatlined in essentially. Um, so if we were to go and run scenarios all the way down to zero, um, which I don't have space for, you would lose $95, $95 all the way down. You can try that on your own. Just plug in, you know, a scenario of zero. The S&P drops to zero. What would happen? So you'd find out you'd have a gigantic payoff uh, loss on the, you know, in terms of payoff on the index, but you'd have a gigantic payoff on the option, which would offset within $95. Now, if we go to the 295 scenario, we'll have a $45 positive profit on on the in, or payoff on the index. We will have um, a zero here for the payoff of the option. The option's out of the money at this point because the stock price is above the strike of 2200. We paid $45. And there we have a break-even point when the profit is zero. And that's why you see I have this funny round, uh, not a round number here. I got this funny odd 2295. You wonder why I had such an odd number there. Well, I wanted, wanted to show you this was the break-even point where the option offsets the, the gain on the, on the index. Now, at 2400, you know, the market... The market's moving the opposite of what the manager, what you anticipated was going to happen. So the index, or the underlying portfolio, goes up per share $150. The option's still out of the money and will always be out of the money the further you go up. And um, what happens is you have $105 profit. Okay? So... Um, what, what this is telling us, looking at the profit scenario here, the most you can lose is $95, which is way better than the losses that we'd have. In fact, we'd be losing $2,250 if the market went down to zero. I mean, obviously not a realistic situation, but nevertheless, it tells you that you're, you're fully hedged. For whatever the, whatever the mar, however the market drops, you're only going to lose $95 a share, and we have accounted for that $95. It's coming from the, the fact that the option is out of the money by 50 and plus you have to pay a $45 premium there. Um, so now the question becomes, um, okay, we did everything on a per share basis and this is an excellent framework, but, um, you know, there's not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between a portfolio of, of various stocks and the underlying index. Um, in other words, it's, it's a little bit more obscure as to how many contracts we need when we're dealing with a portfolio. Let me give you an example. If you go back and if we and think about it, what we do with the cover call, we had a one-to-one -one basically, another, or one contract for every 100 shares, because remember, a option contract controls 100 options, which basically controls 100 shares. So, um... It's a one-to-one, -one, you, it, it, you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to um, protect, put a portfolio protection, protective put on Apple stock, and you owned 100 shares, well, you would need 100 options, right? You would need 100 options, which translates into really one contract, because each option controls 100 options um, or 100 shares. Now, with a stock index, in the example we have, we have a $10 million portfolio, and we're going to hedge it with a stock index. We don't even know what's in here, other than the fact that, it, you know, this thing has a beta of 1.0. We know that. Um, and we, we know it's in the S&P 500, 
But then, you know, the question is, how does, how does this part work? How many shares do we have of the index, essentially? And then how many contracts do we need? It's not as readily apparent as it would be with this Apple example. So that's where we're going to now. I'm going to give you a formula that will calculate the number of contracts that are needed. And from that formula, we'll get a lot of intuition as to why we need such a number of contracts. So the formula, number of contracts, I'll just call it this, is a function of the beta of the portfolio that you're managing times the value of the portfolio you're managing. Okay? Divide it by the beta of the index that you're going to use to hedge the portfolio with times the price of the index. I'll just call it index here, the value of the index. So maybe you want to call this um, VI, value of the index, instead of just index here, so VI. And then you need a, the multiplier, okay? Um, and so the, the multiplier with the example I was just giving you was there was a multiplier of 100. Every contract controlled 100 options. So we basically had a multiplier of a contract represents 100 options. So let's see how um, that all applies to this, to this formula now when we're looking at an index and, and we're looking at a portfolio stocks. Now the beta of our portfolio was 1. Okay, so that's straightforward. The beta of the index of the S&P is assumed to be 1 also. So really that doesn't do anything. Um, this is all 1, doesn't do anything, but work with me because we're going to need this, the, the intuition is going to pop out on the next example when I increase beta. But for now it's a beta of 1. The value of the portfolio is 10 million. The S&P is 2250 when we implemented this and we had a multiplier of 100. But, and so what that translates into, it translates into 44.444 4, 4, 4, 4, 4 contracts with that puts. That's the number of put contracts. Contracts. It's the number of put contracts we're going to need. And so um, what this tells us is right here that we have, we have 4,444 shares of the index essentially because this is the value of our portfolio and this is the price so the value of the portfolio divided by the price per share right the value of the index means we essentially have 4,444 shares and if we have 4,444 shares and each contract controls 100 we only need 44 contracts now you can't buy 44.44 contracts um, so you have to round up or down. If you round up, you may over hedge. If you round down, you may under hedge. Um, but you, you can't trade fractional options. So um, you have to round, round somewhere. I will for um, analysis here. I'm not going to round because I, if I round, then I kind of lose some of the, some of the intuition in, in, in my hedge work. So uh, I want to show you mathematically that things are going to work out really close. And so I won't round in the anal in the calculations. Okay, so now what we want to do is the, the next question is on an aggregate basis, have we really hedged? Is this 44 contract really going to allow us to hedge our $10 million portfolio? Um, going back to the Apple example, it's readily apparent that there's a, a 1 to 100 ratio, so to speak. Um, and on a per share basis, it's 1 to 1. So how do we know that we're, we're, we've hedged our portfolio correctly under the scenarios? So let's, let's do the analysis. And this gets a little, uh, a little tedious, but um, very insightful, very insightful. So remember, going back, we had... Um, 1,700, 2,000, 2,295, and 2,400. So I will pick um, two of these. 
for analysis and I'll allow you to do on your own the 2000 and the 2295 situations. Uh, I'm just going to pick two of this. So now uh, let's think about it. Now we, we have our portfolio, our $10 million portfolio. And um, how much did our portfolio lose on aggregate? We started out with $10 million, but um, when the market drops to 1700, what happened to our value of our portfolio? Well, it turns out that um, 1700 divided by the 2250 where we started out. That is 0.244 loss. So that's a negative. The market lost 24%, right? It's a pretty big drop. 24.4% is what the market lost. Okay, which means you, the portfolio had to drop by two million four 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 four. So I'm just I'm not rounding anything here. So um, the portfolio lost two million four basically in value. So now what we should see is we should be able to account for. Um, we should be able to account for this two million dollar loss right here. We should be able to account for that, and then the fact, and then account for the fact that our our hedge is a little sloppy because we used options that had a strike that was different than the original stock price, right? And then we also, well, you wouldn't call it sloppy. It's just a matter of, of fact that you have to pay a premium for the option. So we have to account for that. So um, what you see here, going back. The, the option had a profit of of um, 455. If you recall, 455 was the profit on the option. 455 times the number of contracts that we had. 44.444. Four. Okay, and each contract controls 100 shares, and so when we multiply that out, we can do the calculations here. We have a positive gain of two million two million wait two million o oh, two 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 okay and so the net effect of this of the loss on your portfolio versus the gain on the options amounts to four, two, two, four, two, four. And we're down, okay? Oh, you know, we're, we're under hedged essentially. Um, and that under hedging, we recall, is coming from the fact that we, we lost $95 on the put, protective put. Now, certainly losing 95 is way better than losing 550. For sure. So we're hedged, but we, you know, we had part of this loss is because we 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 wanted to buy cheap insurance in a sense, and so part of that's um, the explanation. So now we should be able to we should be able to verify this. This come this should be associated with the ninety five dollar loss that we had on the overall position. This guy right here, ninety five dollar loss. So we take the 95 times 44.444 4, 4, times 100, and we come up with 422180. And so um, I'm rounding a little bit. There is a little bit of rounding. I'm not going to keep carrying that decimal out there. So you can see, basically, I've accounted for that, that loss. But that loss is far better than losing 2 million four, right? And so the hedge, the hedge worked. And so that's the point. Now let's do the 2400 scenario. So with the 2400 scenario, what we have is 2400 divided by the 2250 minus one gives us a gain of 0.06667. It was 0.666, 0.0666 keeps going. Okay. Um, 
And so that translates into um, 660, $666,067. So remember, we, we have a portfolio of $10 million and it goes up by nearly 7%. Dollar-wise, it's six hundred sixty-six thousand dollars. Now, um, let's see what happened to our options. Well, our options expired worthless. We lost forty-five dollars per share. We had forty-four point four 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 contracts times a hundred, and so we lost um, on the contracts two hundred thousand dollars, essentially on the contracts. That was the cost of the hedge, basically. You know, we bought this hedge, this protective put, to hedge ourselves against the risk. But no, the market, the market went up, so we really bought insurance that we didn't need. The insurance we did not need essentially cost us $200,000. So the net effect of these two numbers is 4, 6, 6, 6, 6, 7. Okay, positive. Okay. And so where does that come from? Well, we can, we've can we matched it up with this table right here of 105. So take the 105 times the 44.444 contracts times 100, and you're going to come up with 466, 667, approximately. And so there you have it. We've, calculated, we've accounted for... Um, the difference between the portfolio and, and the option itself. Okay, so now what we want to do is let's move on to the scenario of a beta of 2.0. Now, I'm leaving everything else the same in this problem, except we're going to have a beta of 2.0. And so what that means is it's going to change the number of contracts. And this is where it becomes interesting. So the number of contracts, the formula was the beta of the portfolio divided by the beta of the index times the value of our portfolio divided by the value of the index times that 1 over the multiplier. And let's just put a 100 in there for the multiplier. Now, we had plugged in 1 to 1 and 10 million here, 200 and 2250 here for the value of the index, and we ended up with um, 44.44 contracts in the previous example. Now let's see what happens when we have a beta of 2. We have a beta of 2 and we're still using the S&P 500 contracts. What we've just done is we've just we've just doubled the number of contracts we're going to need because all else has remained unchanged in the problem. So that means we're going to need 88.888 contracts to hedge this position. Because why do we need two? So notice the beta of the portfolio goes up, the number of contracts we need goes up. Well, that's because, you know, if you had to draw it graphically, we would have the stock, the, the our portfolio moving like this with a beta of two. The beta of our portfolio of two. But when we have a beta, an underlying beta of the stock market of, of one, it's basically doing this, as best I can draw it. The market is only moving half the amount of what your portfolio is doing. In other words, your portfolio is twice as volatile as, and this is this would be your uh, this would be the index. So this is the index. As you can see, the index is much smoother than, than um, your portfolio. So the point is, you need twice as many contracts, twice as many contracts to, to absorb all this extra volatility that you have in your portfolio. Okay, Because you, this is a 1 and this is a 2. You need twice as many contracts to absorb that extra volatility. So when you have a risky portfolio, it means you need more contracts to hedge. Now, let's proceed with, with the math, um, and let's build a table um, that we can use uh, the framework. Remember the natural framework that we can use to um, analyze the problem. 
Now, here is the trick. On a per share basis, we've already done it. We did it in the previous example. Okay, on a per share basis, we're just, this is the table works out to be the same as what we just did. So, you, you know, the index, we started off at 2250. Um, the index went down to, to 1700. We lost 550 and so on. All this remains unchanged. Okay, all this up here, unchanged. But now the question is, um, what, how, how do we check this in aggregate? And that's where this analysis came in. This analysis means, look, and when we check our work in aggregate to make sure that our $10 million portfolio is properly hedged, then we need to have, um, we need to reflect that two, the, the two beta, which means we basically have to have 88, we have to reflect in our analysis the 88.88 contracts used to hedge. Okay. So let's do the math, and we'll do the math um, at 1700 like we did earlier and we'll do the math at 2400 and I'll leave you oops, to do the the in-betweens the 2000 and the 2295 so recall in our previous analysis the index fell the index fell 24 .444 percent in our previous analysis that was the 1700 divided by 2250 minus one okay so that's a minus uh 24.44 percent okay which um now which which means okay the index itself the s p index fell 24 percent because it went from 2250 to 17 but we have um, we need to look at our portfolio. Our portfolio doesn't move one to one with the index. It moves twice as much. So we need to multiply this guy by two to come up with our portfolio value change. And so our portfolio value change is not, it's not the uh, 2,444,444. It's double this amount. So it's going to be 4,888888 loss. So our portfolio, wow, our portfolio dropped nearly 50%. You know, because it dropped 48.88%. Okay, so, um, okay, so our portfolio dropped a whole lot, but compared to the previous example, we now have 88.8888 contracts so we doubled the amount of drop here the loss because of our beta but we made up for it with having twice as many contracts and so we have a gain of eight now let's see up oh, sorry four oh four 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 okay and so the net difference is um, going to be eight hundred four 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 four. Okay, that's the net difference, and so we can account for that net difference as being the ninety-five dollar loss that we had. Remember the ninety-five dollar loss on the position we had times the eighty-eight point eight 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 contracts times one hundred. And that'll give us um, eight four 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 approximately. Um, there's even there's a, even when I'm doing I'm not rounding much. There's still a little bit of rounding in the in the problem that we have to live with. But it's easy to see that we're offsetting here. So um, this so this should be a negative sign here because we lost a bit, and then we lost the ninety five. Let's get our signs right here. And so we can account for that loss um, as being the result of, again, the same position, the fact that we were out of the money by 50 and we had to pay a, a $45 premium. Now, let's do the 2400 scenario. Under the 2400 scenario, recall, recall when we did the calculation, the index itself dropped by 
um, 6.66%, which means in this case, our portfolio, our portfolio will drop 13.333% now. Okay, so it drops twice as much because our portfolio has this beta of two here. So we lost 13%, which means our $10 million portfolio fell 1,033333. So we lost a million three on our portfolio. Okay, so let's account for it. We, you know, we should, most of this should be made up with the options. Okay, and so um, going back to our analysis, we lost $45 net on the options so minus 45 times 888 oops 88.888 times 100 means we lost four hundred thousand dollars on the oh, oh, oh. back up positive positive we gained on the portfolio so remember it went from 2250 to um to 2400 it's a positive gain positive gain we bought insurance when we didn't really need it in this situation and so we lost four hundred dollars four hundred thousand by buying the insurance and that's the cost of insurance and, you know basically you buy insurance for your house and it, and your house doesn't burn down you know you had to pay for the insurance and that's what we did here okay now we should be able to account for this difference this difference work it out will be um, one three 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 nine hundred and thirty three thousand three 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 is the difference here positive and we can account for that from the 105 here so we take this is the profit on the protective put on a per share basis so take the 105, which is positive, times the 88.888 times 100, and we're going to get um, 933333. And so we've just explained it. So the point of this analysis, it looks kind of messy, is a lot of calculations, but it's very intuitive. Now I did this in, in one, this is the method I thought that was to be able to explain it the best. But you could do it anyway. I don't care how you do it, as long as you can keep track of what you what, what was done um, on a per share basis and translate it to an aggregate basis like we just here did here. So as you can see, um, this is about as realistic as you can get for a course in in financial engineering to be able to address it, um, do the analytics, and then be able to show that it worked and account for the gains and losses. Now, there's one more thing I want to do with the protective put. And that is, I want to graph the relationship that's going on here. And I'm going to use the table we, we've gone through here before with the scenarios of 17, 2000, 2295, and 2400. And I want to graph the results and interpret it. So again, you get it nice and big. I have my sideways T, and I got myself set up here. Um, X is 2200, and um, the stock price was 25, 20, 2250. Okay, and so the line for the stock, you, you could think of this on a per share basis for our our fund that we're hedging stock alone is the familiar line you've seen before it has a slope of one and crosses right where the stock price was at the very beginning when we put the position on so you break even at this point every time the stock goes up a dollar you make a dollar on the option on the stock itself the stock the uh, stock at expiration goes down a dollar you gain a dollar or, or sorry you lose a dollar Um, now, let's put on the put. Now you know uh, the put by itself. You know, by the way, that 
uh, memorized that when you have a, a when you purchase a put, you're going to have a hockey stick that looks like that. So somehow you have to overlay this position, this profile, is sometimes called profiles, on top of here. And you know, by the way, exactly where this is going to kink. It's going to kink. It kinks right at the X. So you know we're going to have a kink at the X. And we know the option costs $45, right? It's this row here, the $45 all the way. So um, looking at it, and this is a little hard to judge, but basically this is going to be the put alone. And this is going to be the upward end of it where we have a slope of negative one, okay? And it kinks at, at 2,200, the strike, okay? Now, um, we'll put a minus 45 here. And by the way, um, if you come right down to this point, it would be down minus 50. It's very hard to draw this accurately, geometrically accurately. Um, but it, it takes a little thought ahead of time. So there we have the stock alone, the stock, you know, our portfolio alone on a per share basis. Here we have the put alone on a per share basis. Now it's a matter of adding the two up in order to get the protective put, and then we can interpret. Well, when we add it up, it's just geographically, we're going to be at, at using this row on this table and, and apply it geographically. So we know we lo the most we can lose is 95, right? Minus 95, and I got it in red. We know we're going to have a kink at X because we're adding a straight line, this straight line right here, and then we're adding the hockey stick together. And we know that this is a slope of negative 1, and this has a slope of positive 1. So the negative 1, positive 1 means we flatline here which is exactly what we've been talking about numerically on this table with the 95.95. And if the stock goes all the way down, the index goes all the way down to zero, you'd still lose $95. That's what this line right here is telling us. That is the floor. We can't go below that. Now it's going to kink at X and it's going to start to rise. That's a straight line, by the way. But um, it's going to have a slope of 1 because we know that this stock alone is a slope of 1. We know this has a slope of 0. And a slope of 1 and a slope of 0 has to add up to a slope of, of 1. And this difference here is the $45 cost. And here to here is the $45 cost of the option all along. So there you have it. This is a protective put. Now, let's interpret, you know, what's going on here. Well, like I said, there's a floor. You can't go below it. And that's the value of the insurance. The insurance will not let you go because the more you drop down and go net low in the stock price this way, the more the payoff on the put. Okay? But now look what happens. Look what happens. You have this unlimited upside potential still. So if the stock goes up really high, in theory, it can go up forever, then you're going to have this unlimited payoff up here. It's unlimited minus the $45 premium you paid for the insurance. So it's not as good as if you had the stock alone, okay, on the upside, because you're, what you're doing is you're trading off some of this value here to put this floor in. And so that's how protective puts work. Now, um, you keep in mind that in the example that we're looking at here, the, the portfolio manager, you, think that the stock market's going to drop um, in the near future, meaning over the next three months. Now, if that doesn't happen and the stock market's relatively stable over the next three months, then you've wasted money putting, um, you know, insuring your portfolio. In hindsight now, you wasted money buying insurance, just like in, you know, you buy car insurance and you don't get into an accident. In hindsight, it was kind of a waste, even though it's legally, you know, uh, legally you have to get it. Buy, buy auto insurance. So um, now the, the point is, what happens if three months in one day the stock market crashes? 
Well, if, if you didn't put on another protective put, then you're out of luck. You're, 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 you're stuck is just going, you're following this line right here. You're following this line right down at that point because this put evaporated. It expired, it's gone, done. And so all you're left with is this line is where you're going to be on. And so three days or three months and one day the market crashes, well, you're gonna to crash too along with it unless you've managed to put on some portfolio insurance just before that. Okay, so that's what, we, that's what I wanted to have uh, covered on the protective put.